is Luke 11, starting in 5 through 8. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you had a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine on the journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answered, Don't bother me. Tell 
love that you give us, Father, for your spirit that binds us together, the spirit that empowers us, Lord. We just thank you that you would love us enough to send Jesus Christ to die for us, and then you would, you would not orphan us. You would give us your very spirit to lead and guide us every step of the way. We thank you for the faith of the men that were at the walk, and we pray for the women's walk as well. Lord, we just thank you for this church, the place that we can come for safety and shelter and learn about you. And Lord, we just pray that you open our minds and hearts today to the words that you would have us to hear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So you saw the scripture this morning, you heard the scripture this morning. Jesus was teaching his disciples and he went on to teach them more about prayer. Because we do fight a spiritual battle, that devil is always trying to get a hold of us. But we're going to learn today a way where maybe we can kick his butt a little bit more because that's what Jesus tells us to do. If you didn't get to watch War Room this Friday night, excellent, excellent movie. There's still some copies back there. If you run out of copies and you want one, tell me. I'll get more. It's an excellent movie to, to watch and see about the power of prayer because a lot of Christians do not realize the power that they have to be able to talk to God Almighty to share things with Him. And don't get frustrated, Ron and I were talking this morning, because there comes points and times when we say, Lord, I'm praying everything in your will. I know that this is in your will and your plan, but you don't seem to be listening to me. You don't seem to be answering me. Why? Why are you not doing that, Lord? <clears throat> so the scripture from this morning was, Then Jesus said to them, He was teaching them about prayer already, Suppose, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Friend of mine, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now when you first read this scripture, if you don't struggle with it, you're not reading it. Because Jesus is talking about prayer. The friend is God. And you come to God and he says, don't bother me. I have a problem with that. You should have a problem with that. So we've got to understand what Jesus is teaching us. Remember, this is a parable or a further teaching illustration about how we're supposed to pray to God. Not just God, but our Father in heaven. Our personal relationship with our Daddy. Because we have the Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father that we have that relationship with Him. We're supposed to be like little children with their Father. And when we come to our Father and ask Him for something that is good and in His will, we don't want to hear, don't bother me, go away, do we? So why would Jesus be telling us this? Why would He be teaching this? <clears throat> well, let's see what Jesus has to say. He says, suppose. What did He say? Suppose you have a friend. You have a friend with your Father. My dad is one of the best friends I've ever had. I've always told Jacob that you can count your true friends probably on two hands, maybe on one hand, and one of them is always going to be your father, right? You can put him in that list. 
if you had a good father. If you didn't have a good father, you have a gracious, loving, heavenly father who is perfect in every way that will show you everything that you did not have as a good, loving father on this earth. But a father is supposed to be your best friend out there. Your, your person that you can go to in time of need and he's there for you. But we don't see this here. You go to him. You go to him with your request. It's at midnight. That's an inopportune time. But I guarantee you if I call my father and it rings at whatever time of the night, he's going to say, what do you need, son? He's going to be there for me. And you say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me. I have no food to offer him. Jesus has just taught about giving us each day our daily bread. So we're relying on God to provide for us just what we need from day to day. But we don't have any bread to offer our friend that's come in this late hour of the night. You'd expect God to say, here we go, right? But Jesus says, suppose you have a friend. And he, you come to him at midnight and he says, don't bother me. <clears throat> you have a relationship with God. Jesus has already taught us that, so don't get frustrated. Not only do you have a relationship... But He is your Father. Your Heavenly Father who loves you, wants to provide for you, not hold anything back, who willingly gave His Son to be crushed for the weight of your sins so that you could be redeemed as His child. Don't ever forget that. Don't lose hope. Don't get frustrated in your prayer life because your Father is in heaven looking down and loving you beyond your wildest imagination. You ought to come to Him with your needs. Scripture tells us to that, and you do in this case. You come desperately because you are out of the food that you need. The spiritual bread, the physical bread that He provides, you don't have it to offer your friend. And we're supposed to go out and tell the world to be the light to the world to supply their physical needs, but so much more their spiritual needs, to give them the bread of Jesus. You have no bread left. You're relying on God to provide that daily bread, just as Jesus had just taught us in the previous verses. And suppose, in verse 7, the one inside answers, don't bother me. Are you crushed? What do you do? And he goes on, he doesn't say just don't bother me, but the door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and I can't give you anything. Not one loaf, not advice. I'm going to give you nothing. Go away, don't bother me. But verse 8 says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Not just what you requested, not what you want lent to you, but as much as you need. As much as you could possibly ever need. If a whole group of friends show up, he's going to supply your needs. <clears throat> your requests aren't answered, they're denied. Don't bother me. You're given reasons of why you're not going to get what you asked for. So what would most of us do? Give up? Go away, go back home, say, I don't understand. Thank goodness we have verse 8 here, right? And we've got to apply that to this because verse 6 and 7, or verses 5 and 6, bother me because I'm going to my Father. You just told me to do that, that I have a personal relationship with Him. I've asked you to teach me how to pray. And I'm not expecting this at all. So let's look back at Luke 11, 1 through 4. One day Jesus was praying. One day. One day his disciples said, Hey, I see Jesus' prayer life. I want that. I want to have that relationship with God. I guarantee they're blown away when Jesus says, Pray, Father. Not anything else. Father, you have that relationship with God. You don't have to come to Him and be worried about things. You go to him as you would go to your father. Just like I said before, if I call my dad who's on the East Coast at midnight, that's 3 a.m. there, and I need something, he's going to be there for me. Now, first he's going to say, what do you need? It's 3 a.m., right? But then he's going to say, son. I'm going to hear, son, what do you need? You wouldn't be calling me unless you needed something. How can I help you? 
I don't doubt that one bit. So why would you ever doubt when you go to God in prayer that He doesn't care? He's not listening. He's not going to give you an answer. Now, you need to be listening for that answer. You need to listen for the whisper, if that's what it is. You need to be aware that I didn't turn my ringer off. <laughs> that whatever He tells you is for your best interest. He knows He wants the best for you. One day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when He finished, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, Lord, Jesus, You're my Master, You're my Teacher. Teach me how to pray. I want to know how to pray. I want to know how to communicate with God. I want a relationship with God. <clears throat> Just as John taught his disciples, and Jesus said to them, When you pray, say this, Father. Daddy. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. If you understand those verses, then verse 5 and 6, you've got to realize, wait a minute, what's going on here? Jesus is trying to teach us something. He's trying to teach us persistent prayer as the sermon is titled today. That we don't give up. That we do make our heart's request known to Him. That it's not a fly by the night thing. That it's not something we want today but tomorrow we don't care about. So if you've got a child that is away from God, that doesn't know God, you pray fervently for him every single day, every time you have an opportunity. You don't give up hope because it is God's will that that child be saved. It is God's will that you come to him and ask him for those things. He is hearing your prayers. He is not a friend who does not listen. But because of your persistent prayer, He will definitely give you as much as you need, is what verse 8 says. <clears throat> so you pray in the right way. You pray in the Spirit. You pray in the direction of the cross. You ever thought about that? Father, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Forgive us each day our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. We have this access to the Father because of the cross. Because Jesus died for us so that we could be reunited with God, not as a God, not as a father of a nation, but as a personal father. Remember that in your prayer life. Psalms 50 verses 14 and 15 say, Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. There are scriptures throughout scriptures throughout scriptures that tell us to pray to God, to have that relationship with Him. Sherry put several on the back of the bulletin. But when we don't get the answer we want, it's frustrating. When we don't see God's timing, it's frustrating. But it's especially frustrating if He says, don't bother me, go away. I don't understand that part. So I have to go on and read to understand that Jesus is telling us to keep on praying, to keep on praying, to keep on praying. Should I give up? No, not at all. Maybe I wasn't doing things right. Well, then examine yourself. I believed and I came to my father expecting to get an answer. When I go to my dad, I expect an answer. May not be the answer that I wanted, but I get an answer. And that answer is in my best interest. I came to him at midnight. Well, maybe that's inconvenient, but my father doesn't care. He's there for me 24-7. There's tons of Bible verses that tell me that. God is not taking a nap with <laughs> whoever. He doesn't need rest. He's there all the time, always there. He's not overburdened by too many prayers or anything else. He hears everyone's prayers, and he listens, and he answers. Lend me three loaves. I asked to lend. I didn't ask just to be given them. I understand there's a cost involved. I'm willing to take that cost. And it's not just for me, it's for my friend. So that I can provide the nourishment to my friend, whether it's physical or spiritual. I asked for an extra loaf. Not because I'm greedy or anything else, but because in case more people show up, that I can share 
the bread of life of Jesus with them. Everything that I asked for was just as Jesus had taught in verses 1 through 4. So what do I do next? Well, Jesus tells us, thank goodness, in verse 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he surely he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. What Jesus is saying here is truly, truly, or very truly I tell you, this is how you pray. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day what we need. Forgive us our sins, because we need to be reminded of that as we forgive others. We especially need to be reminded of that. And lead us not into temptations that I can't handle because I have the Spirit of God with me. I know that I can handle all these things and I know that the Bible says there's a way of escape. So I'm practicing these things. So what's going on here? Verse 8, the Greek word that is used here is only used here. It's anadiah. It means shameless audacity, persistence, annoying persistence to the point of I wish you would go away. You're bothering me. But I'm not mad at you because I am your friend. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not coming demanding. You're coming to me asking me for something that you expect me to do. <clears throat> Luke 18 gives us another story of Jesus that can shine some light on this. Starting in verse 8, it says, And Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. The Bible tells you why he said this exactly here. It's not this cut and dry some places, but it says here. He told them this parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Just what he's trying to teach here. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in the town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, you got that but word, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, she keeps coming over and over and over, I will see that she gets justice, and she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen up, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God relating how God will answer your prayers, bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him. Cry, not just ask, but cry out to Him day and night. Will He keep putting them off? Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you think God's not answering your prayers. Maybe He is. Maybe He's going to. Definitely He will if you keep on praying. There are so many stories out there of people who have prayed desperately for people and then on their deathbeds they accepted Jesus Christ. And I don't believe that that wasn't true for one minute because they had a praying mother or whoever it was praying for them this whole time. And it pays, it pays off. <clears throat> I tell you, he will see they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will, he will, will he find faith on earth? Do you have the faith to continue in prayer, to not give up, to not get frustrated? Or will you continue in prayer knowing that you have a Father in heaven who loves you and wants the best for you? If you give up, you doubt that you have a Father in heaven that loves you. Or you wouldn't give up, you would keep on. There's a story that I read, I don't remember where I read it, it gave a perfect example where a little child his dad sold, told him his prayers, tucked him in bed and everything. Then you know how that goes. Five minutes later, you get a call from the room. Daddy, can I have a glass of water? No, go to bed. I already gave you water. Five minutes later. Can I have a glass of water, Daddy? No, and if you ask me again, I'm going to come in there and give you a spanking. Right? Five minutes later. Daddy, when you come spank me, will you bring me that glass of water? <laughs> Because we see the need. He, he was thirsting. This man is thirsting to feed his friend. And I say spiritual bread, not just physical bread. And he goes to his friend and he gets an answer that blows him away. But Jesus says to keep on keeping on. Don't stop. 
Keep praying. I'm teaching you how to pray so that when you get frustrated, so when the devil comes and attacks you, you say, you're not going to beat me. I believe God will supply all my needs, not just three loaves of bread, but everything that I need. Maybe that wasn't a good enough example for you. Matthew 15, verses 22 through 28 give us another example. This is a real life example, not a parable. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, to Jesus, crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. She's annoying us. She keeps on and on. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Looks hopeless, doesn't it? The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Whew. Yet it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Wow. That faith. Verse 28, then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. You can find that faith that he says, well, I find. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. The woman, through the power of persistent prayer, pleading with God, saved her child. Her child was healed. What about Abram? Abraham? His insistent prayer that saved Lot. In Genesis 18, verses 23 through 32, Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away? and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people? And of course, he's talking about destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, which we know he did. Verse 25, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it <clears throat> from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous people is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. Because see, I'm pushing myself here, aren't I? I'm talking to God Almighty and I'm continuing to push my point. May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, because he's really pushing it here. He's really persistent. But let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? And God answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Now see, here's the difference. If this had just been your buddy, he might have smacked you by now if you kept on, right? But God wants a relationship with his child. If you went to your dad and said that, your dad would say, you know, you are really annoying me now but he would never smack you or anything else because he loves you. You're his child. You're a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. And God bought back each and every one of you at the price of his son, Jesus. He's never going to be mad that you come to him with a question like this, wanting to save people's lives so that they can be restored to a right relationship with God. And Lot was spared out of this. Had, had Abraham not interceded, then Lot would have probably been destroyed right there in Sodom and Gomorrah with no warning whatsoever. But because of Abraham's persistent faith, annoying persistent faith and requests, Lot was saved. Anadiah, the word in the King James is importunity, can be translated as shameless audacity, persistent boldness, and a word that is only used in the Bible to describe prayer life. Think about that. It's not used to describe anything else but our prayer life. Our prayer life should be shamelessly, uh, shameless audacity or persistent boldness. Annoying persistence. 
Not giving up, not failing, but continuing to make the pleas to God based on the first four verses of Luke 11. That we're praying in God's will that His kingdom come, that hallowed be His name, that our sins are forgiven that as we forgive others' sins. That we're not led into temptation but delivered from evil. If we're praying in that capacity, then we're praying the way we're supposed to, so we're supposed to keep on praying and keep on praying. <clears throat> One of two things is going to happen, right? If we keep on with that, we're either going to get smacked or He's going to answer our prayers. He's not going to smack you. He's going to smack you with love. He's going to smack you with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to smack you with answered prayer. Wow. Jesus taught this so that we wouldn't give up. So that we would walk by faith, not by sight. So that we would continue to make our pleas to the Father. Just as He made pleas to the Father. He even prayed that if this cup could be passed from Him, to do that. But the Father's will was much more important. That the lives of those who would choose to follow in His footsteps, it would believe in Him to be saved and restored to a right relationship with God as a son or a daughter. That was what was important. Above any pain or persecution or anything else. Psalms 27 verse 13 and 14 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Prayer with the right motives. Persistent prayer leads to positive answers to prayer. Now you've got to be listening. You've got to be understanding His will because it might not be exactly what you want, but it will be for your best interest. He is answering your prayers. Verse 9 of Luke 11 says, So I say to you, listen up, I'm telling you something else. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Now, unless you study this, you might not understand this because the Greek words have different tenses than, than our words, so you've got to go back to this. And this word ask, this word seek, and this word knock are all continual. They're not a one-time thing. They're ask, 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 keep asking. Seek, look some more, look harder, keep seeking, seek diligently. Knock, I don't have an answer yet. Still no answer. I keep knocking. That's what Jesus is saying here. And then he says that you will be given an answer. You will find what you're seeking for. The door will be open to you. Not it might be, it will be. So verses 10 through 13 go on to say, For everyone, not some people, but for everyone who continues to ask, continues to ask, continues to ask, who is persistent, for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be open. Now he's comparing it. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, because I would never do that as a father, I'm going to give my son good things. Might not be the answer he wanted again, because I know what's best for him, at least I think I do. So I'm going to give him good things when he comes to me. Maybe it's not the right timing. Maybe that wasn't a good thing for him. But I'm going to give him good things because I am a good father. At least I think I am. And if you then, who are a good father, verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, I just said I was good, didn't I? But we're not, are we? We're moral sinners who are saved by grace who continue to do wrong things in the sight of God, even after being saved, but He doesn't turn His back on us. He continues to offer grace upon grace upon grace. If we who are evil fathers know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now why the Holy Spirit? Because sometimes the answers that we want and expect aren't what we wanted at all. We might not understand the loss of a child, or we might not understand this prayer being answered this way. But God knows the whole plan. 
And He'll give us the Spirit in abundance so that we can walk through these valleys of the shadow of death. So that His will can be done. So that we can pass through the temptations. He'll give us the power of God that resides inside of us to handle everything that comes up in life. So when the devil tries to get the best of us, we know that he's not going to because God's going to give us grace and he's going to give us the power of his spirit. So don't give up on your prayer life. Remember that God cares, God listens, God answers. <clears throat> Keep on patiently asking and you will receive. God is not a selfish neighbor. He is in fact the perfect loving father. That's why we see the contrast first. He's not those things at all. He's there 24-7 to hear your requests. He does care. You're not bothering Him. That's what Jesus goes on to say. He negates everything that He said before. Here's some verses that may help you in your prayer life. Colossians 4.2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kind of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. You can memorize this one if you don't. It's pretty easy. Pray without ceasing. Romans 12.12. 12, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Philippians 4.6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. This all came about because one disciple had an aha moment and said, Lord Jesus... Teach me how to pray. Now he said teach us, but he was saying teach me also. And I'm asking you if you'll say that today. Will you say, Lord, teach me how to pray. Give me the power of the Spirit to answer my prayers, to face the things in life that I can't face on my own, that you will supply me with if I just ask and ask and ask. Will you ask him to teach you to pray? It's no wonder if you keep reading that passage, which we've taught about this in Luke eleven fourteen 14 and 15. It says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Because that's what the devil is going to say if you don't hear what Jesus is saying. He's going to say, God doesn't really care. God's not there for you 24-7. God's not going to give you the power. You don't deserve it. You're rotten. I'm going to keep attacking you and I'm going to get the best of you. No, he's not. Don't ever, ever believe that because your Father in heaven is there. Just keep on keeping on in your prayer life. There's a woman, Logan knows who it is, that has a real good way of saying how that we battle with prayer. She knows it's a spiritual battle, that the devil's not going to get the best of us. So let's see 